grateful to invite the founder of one of the rising darlings of the Canadian tech story here, also one of the best performing stocks in TSX in 2020, to join us for a fireside chat here today. He also presented at our Vancouver conference before in uh, 2018. If the audience has invested into his company at that time, they will be also very pleased by now. So let's welcome the CEO and founder of Well Health Technologies, Hamed Jabasi. Hey, thanks uh, for having thanks. me, Gilbert. It's great to be oh, with you. Yes, uh, nice to see you, Hamed. So like to get you quite a bit of uh, questions, uh, dive in a bit more about your background here today and uh, how you found the companies and et cetera. So we have a flu blown of some questions uh, we like to uh, discuss with you here though. So thank you again for your, for spending here time with us. It's great to be with you. Yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, so let me make the first question here. I, I check your background too, right? So you you started out your study in engineering in school, I believe. So actually it's the same as me. So I'm, I'm also in engineering. So how, how do you turn out to become uh, an entrepreneur in the, in the business in the tech world? Yeah, I mean, like, like most um, Persian families, you know, um, I was given a choice between being a doctor and being an engineer. And um, I wanted to be a businessman. So I, I chose the path that was the closest distance to being a businessman, <laughs> which was engineering. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my father was a, was a PhD in engineering from Berkeley, and, and he, uh, he's a really smart guy. I always look up to him. So um, it, was, it, was, it was, I think, you know, really interesting education. It's, it's just a lot of problem solving, which I think is really good to train your mind and uh, just make you kind of proactive in terms of solving problems. And, uh, and so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I have fond memories of it, but, you know, literally the day after I graduated, I started, you know, my first company. So, um, so it, it was, it was, it didn't take me long to, you know, follow my true passion, which was entrepreneurship. Great to hear. So just take us back to the journey here in the, the, your first company, TIO uh, Networks here. So you've there worked for, for a little while. And then at the end, yeah, the company come on board to, to acquire you. So were you surprised a company like PayPal, that that sort of the leader in the pack uh, to come and knock on your door there? I mean, listen, it's, it's always great validation when a, when a top brand like that comes around. But, you know, we had built a really fantastic company and become real leaders in our space. Uh, you know, uh, we were about 100 million in revenue, uh, quite profitable, better than, better than 15 million, uh, 15 million, 15 percent EBITDA margins and, and growing, um, getting a lot of leverage and scale and uh, had um, signed up and integrated with a lot of the different, you know, payment uh, systems that, that uh, were needed in order to create a valuable platform. And so um, I, think, I think that given, you know, where the company was at in terms of its market position, uh, it, it, it definitely, you know, uh, deserved uh, to be, um, you know, validated in, 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 in a way like that. And so um, uh, obviously we're grateful that we could deliver a positive result to our shareholders. Yes, uh, indeed. So that was your first successful venture. So once that venture was was finished, right? Do you do you start planning your next venture already, or or you just wanted to to wait and see move at that at that time? I was always I was I've always been into health and and uh, always been looking at different um, healthcare type concepts. And I was involved in a I had actually uh, founded a company that was already involved in different wellness types of businesses. Um, at first, the, the idea was, was kind of uh, uh, this idea of, of technologies and, and products and services that would help you age gracefully and, and, and have better quality of life in, in, your, in your longevity in your later years. Um, and, and so the early sort of pre predecessor to, uh, to well was wellness lifestyles. And that was had a, you know, partnerships like with Dr. Deepak Chopra and so forth. And, um, and, and as we did more and more research, what we found is, is the real action was in, was in uh, you know, primary care and healthcare and tech enablement of healthcare. Um, this is the biggest sector, uh, you know, often in, in every services economy and in every country around the world, you know, given the importance of health. And, and given that it hadn't digitized and modernized um, to the extent that, that of every other sector, 
it just, there was an incredible opportunity, especially for someone uh, like me, whose whole life has been about tech enablement. And so um, it, to me, that, that, that became a very passionate, very clear opportunity to, to you know, really drive a purpose-driven company that not only can create value and wealth for shareholders, but do something that's purposeful for society. And, and you know, most people don't realize how, how much we owe technology in terms of, of driving better health outcomes and driving better longevity. It's, it's really remarkable, you know, um, yeah, people misunderstand that and, 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 uh, and, and we have a long way to go. And, and I think um, that, that's gonna continue to, to serve us incredibly well. So, so being in this field and, and helping practitioners uh, be more effective and, and delivering better care is something that, you know, really, really seemed very attractive to me. And I'm, and I'm just, I feel really grateful to be in that business now. So do, do you actually see others with doing in, like in your, in the space or you just figured this out about yourself that you figured this is the, the, the sort of the opportunity that you want to take on? Well, at first, um, you know, I, I was doing a lot of research to try and find out, you know, in healthcare, wh where were the expanding markets? Where were the opportunities? That's one of the things I really learned from Tio. I mean, a lot of what's happening quickly and well at, at, at well is because of all the the learnings, all the mistakes, all the challenges, all the windy roads that I had at Tio. You know, uh, because I was a I was a young and you know inexperienced CEO. And the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. So you become more humble. <laughs> uh, but but you do pick up a lot of of, of knowledge and and uh, some experience. And one of the big things that I learned along the way at Tio was. The importance of expanding markets, the importance of big markets, um, and and you know, again, in, in the U.S., this, we're talking about a three to five trillion dollar market, depending on how you size it and scope it. In Canada, you know, we're talking about a quarter of a trillion, and Canada is one of the top five spenders in the world on a per capita basis. So, so as as you as you sort of look at other sectors, and to me, it was it was a lot of you know, I wonder why, you know, my experience. Is in that clinic was so was so bad. I wonder if other people feel the same way. And you start talking to people, and then you quickly realize that no, I mean we 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 have this sort of um, lag in digitization and modernization in this sector, but particularly in Canada too, we were lagging behind all the other uh, countries that have modern medical systems. Of the forty countries that do have, um, you know, more more technology and, and more modern systems, Canada was lagging pre-pandemic in the last quartile. So in the bottom of the pack, there was even a Commonwealth study that showed that even amongst the Commonwealth countries, Canada was in the bottom of the pack in digitization and modernization. So that was also kind of counterintuitive for me, given that we live in such a digital society here. Um, and, and, uh, and I think a lot of it, you know, has to do with business model fragmentation, but all things that you can solve and will be solved with time and, uh, and capital allocation. So, um, you know, the more we learned, the more excited we got and, and we just, you know, felt that we had to jump in and, and, uh, and, and you know, obviously glad that we did so um, at, at the time that we did. So uh, this question is why a lot of us will, will, will really love to hear your answers. How, how will you be able to get uh, Li ka or his associate to, to invest in well in the sort of the early stage of the company? Yeah, so I met um, Mr. Lee's team and and uh, Selena Chow, his partner. I met uh, I met her through actually my my uh, director role at Broadband TV. I don't know if some of you may know the company Broadband TV is just listed on the TSX Exchange senior listing. It's a it's it's a incredible company with um, it's a basically an online video influencer platform that helps influencers monetize their content and because they're so big in terms of, of, of number of views and, and, and quantum of business, the Google founders had invited uh, a few people to kind of like a, a, a very exclusive getaway. Um, and, uh, and, they, and they invited you know, the biggest video partner that they had, which was Broadband TV. And I was lucky enough to tag along with the CEO of the company, uh, the founder. And, uh, and and you know I met uh, I, I met uh, Selena there, uh, so it was just a, a chance visit, and then we built a relationship. And she didn't invest in Tio, but she kind of watched what happened, and uh, and then she became, and then you know we we just communicated over time, and then I was in Hong Kong on uh, actually just on a vacation, <laughs> um, 
And then I decided to go in and see her and, and just, you know, again, let her know what I was doing with well. And, and when I talked to her about the business plan, you know, she, she almost instantly, uh, you know, decided that, that, that they were going to get involved. And within a week, the deal was done that they came in and they became uh, almost 20% owners. But what, what's happened since then is quite remarkable because they've just been incredible investors and they've joined us for many, many rounds. And most recently they, you know, Mr. Lee and, and uh, Selena each put in 50 million. So hundred million dollars that they led in our last 302 uh, and a half million dollar raise to support our latest acquisition, um, which hasn't closed yet. Um, we have a shareholder vote tomorrow. So, so um, yeah, I mean, I mean, really fortunate to have such marquee investors. And of course, you know, Mr. Lee is, um, you know, one of the rare people who really built his fortune through hard work, no scandals, just an incredible human being. And um, they've also been very helpful to us. And increasingly, as, as we become a bigger part of their portfolio, we are getting more help and support from them. Uh, you know, they're introducing us to their bank partners, you know, they're kind of, you know, connecting the connecting us with 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 people of of uh, of uh, of means in their in their circle. So again, just feel uh, really a lot of gratitude that we have them as investors, and 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 I think that's um, it's really helped our momentum as well. Great. So are you you're surprised of how fast your company grew in the past uh, three years? Because in 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 Tiro, it's been a long time before it actually uh, can catch on that you, your company does this exponential growth. To any any risk that you try to mitigate because you're growing so fast at in that pace. Yeah, I mean the the company's been very active in mergers and acquisitions and corporate development, and that's been a big part of the breakneck speed growth that we've had, but we also had very strong organic growth. Um, and, and to deal with that kind of growth and, and that pace, what we've done is we've created a very, um, uh, you know, unique structure. I call it unique because um, it has shades of Berkshire Hathaway. In fact, one of the ways that we, um, that we describe the company now to new investors is we, we aspirationally think ourselves as, as the, um, Berkshire Hathaway of tech enabled healthcare. And so, and so what that means, uh, you know, is, is that we are a decentralized company that focuses on buying and bringing in great leaders with great companies, companies that have a strong moat, companies that, um, you know, typically are profitable and growing and have, uh, um, you know, a, a history of, 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 you know, solid returns and, and, and positive track record. And, and we really try hard to create structures in, in how we buy so that those founders and operators stay and continue to grow those businesses in the same way that they did before. The unique part of our model as compared to a, a Berkshire Hathaway is the heavy emphasis on cross-fertilization and, and insourcing that we have. So once you come into the group, we have six business units today. We're going to be adding a seventh with the acquisition of CRH, uh, hopefully once the shareholder vote passes. Um, is 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 the, the fact that we encourage a ton of intercompany behavior and there's a lot of of that going on and it's really helping the business so examples of that are like in our in our clinical division we're using you know we're leveraging our cybersecurity tools from our cybersecurity division we're using all the digital tools and technologies in our digital apps division we use all the emr technologies that sit in our emr division our emr division you know, test all its products and services in our clinical division. I mean, there's so many um, ways in which having this network effects between these companies have been helpful for us. And so that's why the scope of tech enabled healthcare um, has been really helpful to us because, because now we have so much substrate, so many ways in which we can help an acquired business. So there's kind of this natural halo effect that occurs as well when when, when, when we do make a, a purchase, which, which I think is one of the reasons why you're going to continue to see a lot of momentum behind the company. Yeah. And of course, during your career, you see some of your peers in your market. And what do you think is the most common mistake in running a tech company out there and you like to advise them? Well, I mean, given that, that we're capital allocators and we're very corporate development and M&A focused. Um, if you look at our peers and kind of common mistakes people in our situation make that, that we are determined not to make is lack of discipline. Um, you know, when you grow your currency 
you get a lot more deal flow. Everyone wants to work with you. Everyone has a proposal for you and not every proposal is good. <laughs> In fact, I'll tell you very few of those proposals are good. And the best thing that you can do is, is to tighten up your discipline, not become less disciplined because you have more money, but become more disciplined because you have money uh, because, because more and more people want it. <laughs> um, and so that's what we're doing at well. We're tightening up our discipline and we're determined to, um, to, to continue to do what got us here, which is um, do deals that we feel really good about that, that benefit the shareholder because we're shareholders. You know, um, I don't take a, a, a cash salary. I take all my salary in stock. I put over $6 million of my own capital into the company. Um, so I think like a shareholder um, and, I, and I operate with, with the, uh, you know, with, with long-term shareholder accretion and value enhancement, it, it, you know, uh, in my mind. So let's, let's touch upon about uh, the past 12 months during the pandemic. Um, of course, I've already experienced differently. So how did that go uh, for your company, also yourself personally? I mean, you're, and you know, do you have to make a lot of drastic changes or, or how, well, business as usual? Well, listen, it was a lot of adjustment for everybody. I think what was unique for us is at the beginning of the pandemic, um, you know, we are, you know, we have, we have a substantial amount of practitioners that work it well, right? So in, 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 in all our different, you know, clinical assets and so forth. So you can imagine the change management and, and, and uh, all the different, um, you know, activities that would be required in order to enable um, you know, these businesses to continue, uh, but virtually. So we were fortunate because we had done a lot of technology work and we were preparing to launch our telehealth product uh, for, for, for many months before that. So not knowing, obviously, there's pandemic because we, we really believed in a, the more digital future. So um, so we, we went ahead and, and dramatically accelerated our plans and launched our telehealth product. And I mean, there was weeks and months where we didn't sleep but we were really grateful to be in a position to help practitioners and patients because of course there was this massive dislocation and and people that were physically meeting you know it, it, we're talking about telehealth being less than one percent penetration uh at one point in time uh before the pandemic and now and, and during the peak pandemic period where the lockdowns were quite pervasive you know we were talking about it went up to maybe 70 or 80 percent and now it's probably you know around 50 percent uh, or maybe maybe more than 50%, but we think it'll sort of settle in the 40 to 50% range. Um, so so the, the change management was enormous and, and obviously there was stressful moments, but I'm really grateful we have a great team and, and we just kind of, you know, you know, took steps every day and tried not to get uh, too anxious about it and just, you know, make, make, make progress every single day towards our goals. And, uh, and um, obviously, you know, happy that, the world seems to be going in a direction where um, we're going to have, um, you know, people vaccinated and 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 hopefully uh, back to a new normal in, in, in the near future. Where where we really believe that, you know, this has been an enormous, you know, uh, accelerator for digital health overall. And now practitioners and patients all want more of it. Not, you know, we don't think it's, any of this goes away. In fact, you know, even even as cities open up. Uh, and and uh, and things happen. You know, we're we're seeing continued acceleration of these technologies, which which is great. Sure. So our time is pretty much uh, running out, but uh, let's get you one last question. Let you conclude. Uh, do you the kind of person that that set goals in the beginning of the year? Like, what's your what's your goals for this year or your for your company? Well, um, you know, we're we're we're, we're quite excited about the CRH acquisition. I think that gives us more than 3000 doctors in the US, you know, GI practitioners that, that we want, that where we provide two products and services to today um, through uh, CRH provides. And a lot of people consider it to be a clinical play. It really isn't. It's, um, it's a product and service company. Um, it actually doesn't own clinics, it, it serves clinics. And so uh, it's a massive channel that generates enormous EBITDA and cash flow and, and, and revenue. And we want to expand that from two products and services to to five, so add three products and services that are related with things like data protection, digital patient engagement, and chronic disease care management. And so we're very excited about that. Uh, we also think that helps pave the way for a more um, 
uh, you know, a, a more direct list listing. Um, I, I mean, when I, sh I should say a direct listing on, on the United States exchanges. So that's one thing that we're really considering uh, extensively now, given the growth of the company and given that post CRH will be a majority US revenue business. So we're doing a lot of studying and work on that to see the feasibility of doing that um, this year. Uh, and, and that's something that we would we think we think would work really well, just given the growth and the size and the profitability of the business now, uh, it, you know, should CRH pass, uh, uh, you know, uh, the shareholder vote and close uh, in the next few days. Thank you again for your time here again, uh, Hamad, for sharing uh, with us a lot of good insights here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really Indeed. So until next time we talk. So